morning, I'm Mary Reese. Welcome and good morning. Good morning, Maddie. Morning, Fidelia. Hello. So welcome to the second year of the New Jersey Institute for School Leadership. With us today are members of the first cohort, our new second cohort, their coaches, FEA staff, and institute guests. As project director, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about this project. It's a very important initiative to which you have been accepted. More than two years ago, FEA was approached um, by the Macmillan Family Foundation with a request to design a model to support school leaders in recognition of the complex positions you will hold. They asked us to review the work of the Academy for School Leaders in Philadelphia, discuss the concept with state and national experts, and create a model for New Jersey's school leaders. We gathered a development team who, during the planning stages, and some of them are our current experts who are helping to design our monthly sessions. And I think uh, Tom is one of them. Because thank you, Tom Barclay. We piloted the year, the first year, with school leaders from New Brunswick and Bayonne. And they're going to continue for a second year. We learned a lot from the pilot members, from their coaches, and from the results of our external evaluator. All of these reflections are influencing this new year. And I want you to know that we do value your feedback, whether it's formal or informal, through your coaches, directly to us, because you know this is a, a work in progress, and we're very interested in making it the highest quality possible. FEA's uh, leadership has been steadfast in its support of this work. And I thank Dr. Donna McInerney, who is the CEO of FEA, and Karen Bingert, our executive director of uh, NJPSA and the FEA president, as well as uh, Denise Heckberger, who may join us in a little while, um, FEA's CFO, as well as our assistant executive director for PSA. But we wouldn't be here today without acknowledging the vision of Nancy McMillan, the co-founder and president of the McMillan Family Foundation. It's dedicated to supporting organizations that strengthen and enrich our society through cancer and medical research, through education, and through the arts. Nancy has been the driving force behind the development of this in institute, and I'm very happy to introduce her to you now. Thanks, Mary. I am pleased to be here and see all of you. I am starting with remarks repeated from last year, but new to many of you and probably forgotten by last year's <laughs> people. <laughs> and I'm going to repeat some of what Mary said because I have prepared remarks and I'm not good at editing on the fly. As Mary said, a bit about a, our foundation. It's been around for quite a while, but it's just been in the last few years that we've formalized with the staff with the goal to help and really have impact. As Mary said, our categories are cancer research, arts, and education. Our goal in education is simply to improve student outcomes. We know that's key, and you are key to making this happen. The principals, your teachers, and all those who interact with the students. As Mary said, I had learned of a similar initiative in Philadelphia a few years ago, and I'm so grateful to many, and particularly Mary, Pam, where did you go? <laughs> and the, the, the two of you and several others to make this all happen. I also want to introduce our program officer at our foundation who's been helping this effort and shepherding as well, Sophie Andresen. 
I'm DeRay Austin. <laughs> Last year's message was, I'm so excited to welcome our first cohort for this program. <laughs> we look forward for you to learn new skills, be supported by coaches and each other, and be positioned to make changes in, at your schools. All again with the overall goal of improving student outcomes. Thanks for being here. Can't wait to hear how it goes and what you'll be able to bring back to your schools as well as your feedback on this program. Now we welcome the second cohort with a program that's been changed a bit thanks to your input and experience of the first group. Good luck. Thanks again for your participation. I know this program working with your coaches and colleagues in this cohort will be a very valuable experience, ultimately, again, helping to improve student outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm so happy that you're able to welcome this second cohort again. Appreciate it. And Sophie, we're really glad that you're our program officer. Sophie provides us with a, a lot of really good creative ideas, and it's nice to have her on our team. Appreciate it very much. So as our, <laughs> well, we can share, okay? <laughs> as the project moved forward, it became apparent that it was time to um, obtain the services of an experienced administrator to help us coordinate this program. So coincidentally and happily, Pam Moore was at the point of embarking on the next chapter of her professional life. So Pam began her teaching in, in Camden and then moved on to Millville where she was a principal and assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction for many years. And last summer, she accepted the call and has joined our team as the project coordinator whom you've all probably heard from prior to this meeting, but you'll be hearing a lot from her throughout the year. So, Pam. What Mary didn't mention is when I got the call, I was thinking about what am I going to do with my life, right? I'm retiring. <clears throat> Pardon me. I want to stay connected to education, to leadership, and like an answer to a prayer, Mary called with this phenomenal opportunity, and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time with comments this morning. We'll talk more this afternoon, because what I'd like to do is turn this over to Karen Bengert, the executive director of NJPSA. And you heard Mary mentioned her other titles, president of FEA and, and chief bottle washer and cook, right? So one, I, I asked Karen if she would bring us some words. Karen opens every program with, with such beautiful and thoughtful words, and they always seem to be the exact thing I need to hear at that exact moment. And usually it's like five minutes, six minutes. I said, you know what? I wonder if she could do 30, 40, 50, 60. I think we set it on 30, something like that. I, I can assure you that you are going to receive these words of wisdom, of, of inspiration, of hope, um, of future things to come and leadership in a nutshell uh, from Karen Bingert, who will be the next voice you will hear as, after you finish clapping. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. It is truly wonderful to see you. Um, as, as, well, first off, we all love when we're doing something and, the, and someone gives you an opening like the one that Pam just gave me because you think, oh, boy, I don't think I wrote any of that. I don't think I prepared any of that in what I was going to do. 
But let me tell you a little bit about myself to begin with. Um, again, my name is Karen Bingert. I am a career educator. I spent 29 years in the public school system. Started out teaching at Asbury Park High School, so urban experience. Then moved down to Southern Regional High School, so suburban experience where students would bring uh, surfboards to school because if it was a good tide that day, they were going straight to the beach. Then I went up to Hillsborough High School where I became a vice principal. Um, at a whopping 29 years old, and I thought, what on earth am I doing getting into education, educational leadership at this point of my life? But you know what, there are people who along the line see potential in you and raise you up. Seven years later, I became the principal of Hillsborough High School, which I did for 15 years before retiring. And um, much like Pam, I wondered what I was going to do when I retired, so the very next day I started as the executive director of NJPSA <laughs> after a long and leisurely day of relaxation on the beaches of Ocean Grove. So I come to this um, session this morning with, with a very simple title for you. I have all the answers for you. Leadership in a nutshell. Okay, because in my mind it really does come down to one thing and we'll talk about what that one thing is in just a few minutes. But the first thing I want you to do is take a minute and look at the picture that's up here. Okay, you have five different people and tell me what you see in their faces. What's happening in this space and who are these people in that particular meeting? And just call it out. Very conversational morning for us. Focused? Happy? Engaged? Anything else? They're kind of crooked. They're kind of crooked? Okay. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Okay. Perfect segue. See someone looking like here we go again. Now sit back. And this is your faculty meeting. Who is each person here in relation to your faculty meetings? Okay. So tell me now who these people are. I don't need names, obviously, we're educators. We never use names, but what's the person, I'll, I'll end with him. What's the personality of this man in the middle? The, the no, the, the uh, yellowish, the mustard shirt. He wants information, okay, that's one possibility. Um, the blue shirt in the back. <laughs> Been here, done this, third principle we've had, okay. The young lady in the front seated. Say that one again. Did you just say fake it till you make it? Okay. I have another interpretation on her, which I'll tell you in just a second. What do you think of the leader who's standing at the front of the group? What's that person doing, thinking, trying to be, trying to say? She's trying, right? She's just trying. And how about this guy right here? Questioning, pushing back, right? Mr. Positivity, okay? So we have a couple of interpretations that we can put on each of these people. Here's a leader who's trying. Maybe this body language is, I know you don't want to do this, but you have to. Okay, or maybe the body language is, you've handled this and I know that you can. The next person, the young lady there, maybe her body language is, you know, new kid, I need to pay attention really closely. Or maybe her body language is, I could do this better than you can. <laughs> the young man in the mustard shirt, I'm gonna go with the wants information, but I'm also gonna go with the, did you think about that? And what about this? And how about that point? And the gentleman in the back in the blue shirt. <sighs> I could be grading, I could be coaching, I could be planning lessons, I could be doing anything else but this. But that body language is some of the negativity, negativity that we see in some of our faculty meetings. And this guy on the end, we all know him. Whether it's a him or a her, we all know this person who sits there and says everything you don't want him to say. He pushes back on everything you do, and you have to figure out a way to bring your goals to fruition with this person sitting in your faculty meetings every time. 
So let's talk about the, the traits and the characteristics of leadership and what really, really works to create a highly effective school leader. Now this phrase, think, stare, pair, share, I stole from my colleague who is my counterpart in Washington State. I love this, because I'm gonna ask you a question, I'm gonna ask you first to think about it, and then I'm gonna ask you to stare awkwardly at the people around you, because that's what we do when we do group work. And then you're gonna pair up, or even group up, it's okay, and then share your, th your thoughts. A really quick, down and dirty list of characteristics of a highly effective school leader, traits of a highly effective school leader, skills of a highly effective school leader. So I want you to take about a minute or two just to think, start jotting some stuff down. There's a wonderful notebook there just for you labeled NJISL, dig in and start making some notes. Okay, one or two minutes of your, of your general list. Don't do the top five most important yet. I want as comprehensive a list as you can come up with. All right, and when, when you think you're close to done sharing, the next thing I want you to do is come up in a group. If you paired up, it's gonna be easier. And you guys, I heard say, you had a lot in common to begin with, so good for you. If you're in a bigger group, this might be a little harder, but agree on the top five most important. And I'll give you a good three, maybe four minutes for that. Okay, if you would start to wrap up your lists. It was really fun standing up here and watching as you were having those conversations. And I was seeing a lot of head nodding, and then, and then I was seeing a lot of leaning in, and a lot of advocating for what was on your own list, and then stepping back a little bit, and then some compromising. So let's just do a quick run around some of the tables in the room. Let me have your top five things. You don't need to qualify them. Just rattle them off. Any volunteers? Go ahead. Ability to communicate, collaborative, uh, goal-oriented, students first, and flexible problem solving. Excellent, thank you. How about another volunteer? Empathetic, collaborative, good communicator, problem solver, self-aware, but slash reflective. Excellent. How about one, one or two more in the back? Um, student or person-centered, lifelong learner, visionary, decision-maker, communicator. Good. And I'm going to go with my table of two here because you guys were in, in a lot of agreement all along, yet you worked really hard on that list, and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, we said excellent communicator, student-centered, visible, uh, critical thinker, problem solver, and then being well-balanced. Okay. All right. All excellent choices. So take a look at this list. It's a very important list. Ten traits of, a, of successful school leaders. All right. Building community, empowering teachers and cultivating leadership skills, using data and resources, having a vision and a plan, being collaborative, or creating collaborative and inclusive learning environments, being passionate about their work, risk-taking, leading by example, persevere in this day and age, being with a school or a district five years or longer, and being lifelong learners. I'm gonna tell you, this slide was a very carefully curated Google search And this was the very first one that randomly came up. And it is, if you, you can't read this, but it's 10 Traits of Successful School Leaders, the University of San Diego online degree program description. Okay? So why did I pick this? I picked this because of its complete randomness. I picked this because you can go online, you can open any book, and you can find any list of the top five, and I'm gonna show you a top seven of something else in another few minutes, of the things that make a good leader. Everyone has an opinion of what makes a good leader. Now we do have some really comprehensive guidance in our worlds for what really makes a good leader. I know we're all familiar with the, the peace cell standards. Right? And everything that's on your lists can be found in here. But I would hazard a guess 
that if you looked at the things that were on your lists, they're going to fall into only a few of the standard categories. So taking a look at this, tell me which standard resonates for you the most based on the list that you and your group or your partner created. Any volunteers? And if you can't read them, let me know. I can, I can run through them for you. In the back? Standard five, community of care and support for students. Anyone else? Standard seven, professional community for teachers and staff. Do you already notice a commonality in those two? One keyword? Community? So here's another carefully curated list of skills and traits. Seven tips for effective school leadership. This was the second thing that came up in the Google search. Because again, the randomness of what people expect of you as a leader depends on who they are, where they're coming from, what their story is, and what you yourself are going to bring to the table. So this also, frankly, falls into the standards five and seven on the PCEL chart, right? Respect, clear goals, input, example, feedback, delegation, which is important for your own sanity, and making meetings matter, which is something that if you ask your teachers, everything could be in, a, uh, in an email. Um, they sometimes forget about the community building part of actually coming together in a space, but that's okay. So these are other things that someone out there thought was important. Now this one was actually an, uh, an article in Edutopia, so I know that a lot of us read that. But here's the thing. What does all of this have in common? I have, this is something that I have said for years, and I think it's an important thing, and I use it frankly to remind people who say things like, I pay your salary, or say things like, teachers are glorified babysitters, or say things that are dismissive in nature of the work that we do in education. But education is the only field, the only one, where every single one of your clients shows up every single day. But the ones who are there are not the ones you're worrying about the most. The ones who are not coming in, the ones with chronic absenteeism, the one with home lives that are fractured, the ones who are responsible for taking care of the little children and their families, the ones who are working because mom and dad aren't, they're the ones that are the very top of the list of our concerns. But we also have all of the rest of them. The doctors out there, their offices are not filled with every single person that they have a chart on. The dentist's offices are not filled with every single person that they have those oddly little misshapen charts on, stacked on back walls, okay? But in education, you're dealt everyone every single day. And you as the leader have to figure out the way to make all of that work. So, if you ask me, what the most important thing is about effective leadership, it's relationships. Hands down, it is relationships. And with that, the thing that I think is most important is you have to know yourself, all right? You have to know your strengths. You have to know your weaknesses. You have to use your strengths to compensate for your weaknesses while you continue to work on your weaknesses. You also have to know how others see you. If others think that you come into a faculty meeting, or if you come to an event, and you're closed off, and you're held back, and you're not engaging, and you're not making eye contact, and you're not connecting with people, they're not gonna trust you, and they're not gonna feel that, that connection with you. And then that's gonna give them pause about the decisions that you actually are making in your role as a leader. So you have to know how others see you. And then most importantly, you have to reflect and you have to work to improve. Because if you're stagnant in what you do, you never grow. Now I'm gonna be really honest with you about something. I think I was a good principal. I actually think I was a, a pretty darn good principal for a high school principal with 2,400 kids. And then I started working at NJPSA. And then I realized what 
that principle was doing and what that principle was doing and what that principle was doing. And I thought, well, I did this, but I didn't do those. And so the enormity of all of those started to build on me in my reflections of my career as a principal because I wasn't doing all of those things. And it took me easily a year being here before I stopped and I said, wait a minute, I don't need to do all of those. I needed to do what was right for my school. My things for my school were the things that made the difference. But you continue to learn, you continue to reflect, and you continue to look for ways to make your experiences better for yourself as a leader, which makes them better for you, uh, for your staff, and for your students. So reflecting and improving. So I'm going to let you in on a little insight here. For 22 years as a school administrator, this was one of my closing questions for every interview that I ever conducted for somebody coming into, into my school. And this was important to me. So I'm gonna ask you to sit and reflect for a moment, and then I am gonna ask you to share with each other. But here's my interview question for you. I want you to think of a colleague with whom you have worked exceptionally well, and in your mind, this better be a real person. From that person's perspective, identify why that person believes you are a good leader. Okay, you'd never have to identify the person, but from that person's perspective, why does that person think you're a good leader? Take a moment and reflect and jot down some ideas, and yes, you will be sharing this at your table, and maybe a couple of volunteers with the group. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a minute. Is there, anyone, is there anyone who's willing to answer this question for me? From that person's perspective, identify why that person believes you're a good leader. Anyone willing? <laughs> the one who actually raised his, arm, his hand on his own. <laughs> a willingness to improve, or like a looking to improve based on the feedback of others. Okay, willingness to improve, looking to improve based on feedback of others. <laughs> I love the nomination. So I have work prior to becoming an administrator with a um, teacher that still happens to be um, in my school, and I am now in a different role. And um, throughout the years that we worked together, we did a lot of projects, and he was always grunting, and he was next door to me, and whatnot. So um, the day I stepped out to be a STEM coordinator first for the district, he gave me a card. And one of the quotes that he put in the card that um, that he thinks that I'm going to be a great leader because I pushed him to be the best he can be. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, and that's genuinely from a colleague who's worked with you e extensively. Um, and for those of you who've ever changed positions within a district from a teaching position to a leadership position, you know that that is easy, delightful, and pleasant, and in all possible ways, um, because no one has changed their opinions of you just because you got up that morning and put on the same pair of shoes you were wearing yesterday. So, so there's always that. All right, how about one more? And any one more? I'm not going to take nominations if you want to. No, 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 no. But if you do want to volunteer, I will take those volunteers. One more. Go ahead. Ability to make connections. OK. All right. Again, these are coming down to things that are very connected and people driven. So of course, if I'm going to ask that question, you need to ask the harder question. And here's the harder question. Think of a colleague with whom you did not have the best professional relationship, a real person, because as much as we believe that we can get along with and make things work with everyone, it is not humanly possible. None of us is perfect. So think of that real person that, with whom you did not have the best professional uh, relationship. And from that person's pr perspective, identify what that person believes you should do differently the next time you work with someone just like that person so that you are able to be a better leader for that person. Okay, take a minute and reflect on that. Oh, this is normally the point of the interview where people go, <laughs> and they're debating, do they tell me the real story? Do they not tell me the real story? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to bring it back up here. I'm not, 
in this case, I am not going to ask you, in this case, I am not going to ask you to share those answers, okay? I'm not. I do appreciate, though, that you immediately, not even the personal reflection part of it, but you immediately jumped in as groups to share this because these are kind of our own war stories and they're the experiences we've had that have shaped our leadership in one way, shape, or another. But what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at that question and look at the question analytically. Why do I ask that question? What do you think I get out of it? That one and the one before it, but most specifically this one. What do you think I get out of this when I ask this question? Gives us reflection. Okay, reflection and feedback. Absolutely. As school leaders, we're always going to have that harder person, and it's really thinking about what we need to do or can do within our domain to kind of help influence that person in a positive way. Absolutely. There, there's one other really big thing that I'm wondering if anybody's going to pick up on. Go ahead. I'm just thinking you're, lead, you're leading everyone, not only people everyone. Absolutely. You're responsible for everyone, not just the ones who like you. I think you guys. That's, I hadn't even thought of that one, but I like it, and I'm going to count that as one of the reasons that I always use this question. <laughs> Last chance. <laughs> when you are negatively criticized, would you take a lesson to uh, whether to Also a very good point. Can you reflect, can you take it, and can you turn it into something beneficial? Action on your reflections. And what do you mean by that? Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Exactly. So let me tell you the key to this question for me. The very first thing that I say is from that person's perspective. And let me tell you how revealing it is when the answers that I get are I followed by anything. I could improve upon da, 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 da. No, from that person's perspective, that person would tell me that I. OK, are you actually stepping back and putting yourself in that person's shoes? And that, for me, is very character revealing when I'm looking at somebody that I'm thinking about bringing on my staff here or most definitely in the high school. Is that person able to step outside of their tunnel vision of an I statement and wear someone else's shoes, even theoretically, in their brain for five whole minutes? And that, for me, is what I get out of this question. So I'm going to give up on the clicker. Oh, there we go. Just a little slow. So this actually was a carefully chosen quote. But the most important single ingredient in the formula of success is knowing how to get along with people, from good old Teddy Roosevelt. But here, and this is why I said leadership in a nutshell as the title of this presentation, I think there are a couple of simple rules of thumb that we can all live by. And it doesn't matter which list you look at. It doesn't matter which set of standards you look at. In the middle of all of it, is the humanity of the people that you work with and that you lead. So some simple things. Mean what you say and say what you mean. How often have you tried to ask your staff, your students to do something, your colleagues, the other people on your team to do something, you haven't really formulated it very clearly and then you're disappointed with the results that you get. Okay, so that's in terms of the, the planning aspect of it. Actually, that should be more don't assume uh, I, your, that your expectations are clear. But mean what you say, say what you mean. Be forthright. Let people know that you are trustworthy, that what you say is what you will stand for, what you will believe, what you will follow through on at all times, because they will know then that you have something to offer them and that you're not going to lead them astray on a whim. And then don't assume your, your expectations are clear, as I started to say before, but it, it actually was related to that first point. But we've all given directions. We need this to happen. And if we don't lay them out a certain way, people don't give us what we need. And that impacts kids in the end. 
because if the teachers don't know what's expected, if the counselors and child study team and all of those incredible adults who are caregivers for these children don't get the guidance that they need to do things with clarity and with a confidence builder for themselves that they're giving you, their trusted leader, what you need and what you're expecting, it leaves them off kilter and that also has a ripple effect for the kids. Be transparent. So transparency. Now, strong connections see everyone through difficult things. That example also leads me to a couple of other examples of things that I really wish I wasn't good at as a principal, but I was really good at them. And I, I'm not a braggart, I, that's not me. But if you talk to people who worked with me for any period of time, they'll tell you there are a couple of things that I was really good at. I was good at handling student deaths because we had far too many of them for far too many reasons. And I was good at letting staff go. Not because I ever wanted to, not because I didn't care for that person personally, not because of any other reason except that, because I did the other things that were up there, I meant what I said, I said what I meant. I didn't assume that my expectations were clear, not that I was perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You can talk to the rest of the people who will tell you that. But I was also transparent, so when it came time to sit down in my office and have that really hard conversation with that possibly even year three heading into year four, year four heading into year five non-tenured teacher, there were no surprises. And the relationship was such that we'd sit, I would say I have to have a, a difficult conversation with you, and I am truly sorry about that. And we would talk, we would cry together a little bit if that was necessary. If they were angry, I would take it. And then I would remind them gently of the things that we had done. I would take the teacher who was sitting with me in the nurse's office and she would say, why do I have to go home? I'm fine and it's already nine o'clock at night and I'm just going home anyway, so why are you sending me home and why does it have to involve an ambulance? And because the answer was, it's not nine o'clock at night, it's nine o'clock in the morning and you are blackout drunk in front of students on the floor rummaging through your bag looking for bottles. And I could cry and she could cry and at the end of the day, we could get her where she needed to be and do the things that we needed to do. And that is the relationship building that makes everything else that you need to do in a school possible because you will stand by and stand for the things that are most critical for you. But then on a really positive note, because we all get good at doing the hard things, we have another responsibility in, in leadership, and that's establishing shared leadership, okay? That is bringing people into the fold and saying, you have something to offer, and I need you to come and help me with this project. Or I need you to think about going back to school and getting your master's degree or coming here and being a part of Excel and, and getting your certification. I need you to come back in three years and join our administrative staff. I need you, you to go to any school anywhere and share these gifts and build up that next level of leadership. Because now I'm also gonna put on my association hat. We have staffing shortages, which will eventually impact administrative shortages. I don't know if you're feeling a little stretched thin already and it's August. Right, the kids aren't even here yet other than ESY wrapping up and sports starting to kick off, right? But if you don't create that culture in your building where people wanna stay, where people wanna be with you, where people know that you mean what you say, your expectations are clear, you're transparent with them, you've 
building strong connections so that you will see each other through everything that can come up and that you're gonna support the people and say, you have a place here, you have a voice here, you have a value here. You are us and we are you and my success is your success. That is what makes everything else on that peace cell chart come true. And with that, I thank you. I thank you for everything that you do for your schools every day. I know they don't line up at the doors to scream and shout your name in favor and throw flowers in the pathway as you walk by. I know that, but know that you are appreciated because the people who truly understand what you do know that you are knocking it out of the park. So thank you. meaningful to them personally today. Anybody want to step up? Okay. I don't know if everybody heard that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm totally qualified. I'm forgiving. 
Okay. And our hope lady? Oh, Judy Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else? Right here. for you with that word to leadership. So again, quiet time for a minute. Do you want to share it quickly or we're going to share with your groups again? So talk about the word on your stone and leadership and then we'll share out in a few minutes.
walked into this room today. So again, there's really a North North Jersey connection here beyond the wall of what you know insularly as your own district. So Chris, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, commenting excellent so thanks for sharing those words of wisdom. Anyone else? In the yellow? ago, um, somebody did this activity at a workshop that I was at, and they might have been different words. This word, this one's, this stone says, thank you. And I realized through my years in central office, in a district with 46 schools and 30,000 kids and about 5,000 staff, I started to say thank you all the time. Um, open a door, thank you, come to school, whatever. I do it at Macy's, I do it at Starbucks, I do it everywhere. It became part of what I said because I realized if you didn't acknowledge people in some positive way, 
they'd go, oh, I held the door open for her and she didn't even say thank you. You know, there'll be some negative comments. So it was just a reflection and a realization that it became part of who I was when Joanne talks about mm. when we walk into a room, people know. You'll hear me say it here all the time. Um, Rob, one of our assistant coordinators here said, you're only saying thank you, Adele. I said, I mean it. And the other part of thank you is the gratitude piece. Um, I'm thanking you for being with you today um, in this experience that we're continuing to talk about leadership and relationships and um, friendships and a growing network. So um, keep your stone with you. Um, it brings you some solace when you're in, a, in the midst of something. It's usually on my desk at home or somewhere close by my pocket. But um, we thought we would talk about how to use this as a tool. Um, again, you're the leaders of a building or a unit or something. Um, we're not saying that you should go to Amazon and buy these stones for your staff, but you may want to. But Marie has used it in different ways or has seen it used with words on cards, um, picture cards, with cards with pictures on them, not words. So again, in terms of thinking about how you might use this differently or how you've seen it used in other situations, there's a lot of variations for the purpose of why you would do an activity like this. It could be an icebreaker. Um, it could be with students. It could be with staff. It could be with parents um, to start your next parent council meeting if you're presenting at it in an entirely different way. So again, we're open to all kinds of ideas and we'd be interested in you sharing um, some of the ways that you think you could use this in your leadership role as a, an activity. You know, Del, over on the table, I part of my artifacts, I bought in three shells. I live, I live down in Neptune City, right by the water, on uh, Shark River. So I, and so um, one of the activities I've done is just collect shells over the course of the summer, come in and done shells of all different shapes, sizes, smooth ridges, beautifully formed, need some work, a little chip. And um, I've done an activity um, similar to this, except I've had people select a stone that um, reminds them of a student that less, left the lasting impression. And to select that stone, and that begins a conversation and brings it to kids. So that's one way I've used a similar um, activity. Anyone care to share how they could, would have? Think about using something like this going forward. Yes? I'm going to share because it's very relevant to the culture right now. We're doing something like this for new teacher orientation, but we're doing that with Taylor Swift's friendship bridges. Oh, oh cool. I know. I've tried to cool at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us who you are and where you're cool regularly. Where are you from? There you go. So, I mean, if anybody's looking for something, especially for teacher. Who are you? really be um, current, right, to, to switch a friendship versus good idea. Great. Okay. And yeah, we're ready for the second time of week. And as Adele said, we invite you to hang on to your rock. They're nice and smooth. They make very good worry stones <laughs> that you can hold on to. Yeah. Okay.
and um, the collective. And I'm going to suggest to you that um, for me, um, it always starts with quiet time. Time for me to think about um, the values that I'm bringing to any situation. Um, family, friends, professional associations. And, and I think about as I'm having this quiet time, and a part of what you'll see on the artifacts table for me, are, you'll see a book called The Power of Thankfulness, and it has lots of tabs in it. It was given to me by a former student um, when she got her law degree, and I read it. I read from it, if you were to open that book, you'll see at the top, the year. And she gave it to me six years ago, and almost every day I, I read from that. And it's amazing how that tool, I say, I know this was written commercially, but you would think that this statement that I'm reading today was written for me because it fits. Um, and so, Knowing yourself, what tools, what artifacts would be a, a part of you when you're absent? I loved it when I was a high school principal and, and my principalship was to design the demonstration high school for Rutgers University um, at the time when New Brunswick had been coming through social disturbances, com commonly called the riots. And, um, Rutgers stepped up and said, we'd like to help and share in this. And so a, uh, a demonstration high school called the Gibbon School um, was established. And I loved it when the head teacher said to me one day, was, we were talking about how students' behavior is ongoing. He says, it doesn't matter whether you're here or not. There's an aura that's left, and the students always think you're in the building. And I was like, <laughs> you know. Now, I didn't realize that, but that was um, terrific. So what's the aura? Um, I carry within me memories of beloved educators who made a difference in my career. And the first is my second grade teacher, who stayed with me through my life. As a matter of fact, in um, just a few recent years, I was surprised at um, the clippings and the information that she had that my mother didn't have. <laughs> you know. Another was John Heldridge, who was a senior vice president of Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson took a very fine interest in the public schools, um, particularly during my years, which were 25 years that I stayed in the same place by choice in New Brunswick. I stayed there because I wanted to be there because I love the vibe and, and I love the relationships that I had with the families in the community and my colleagues in the school district. Um, and John Heldred said to me, hire from your weaknesses. What you don't know, that's, that's what you need to look for in people you're bringing in. Who has strengths that are your weaknesses? And so connections. Um, and then um, always making the connection of my values. So valuing the arts, valuing reading myself and not just asking other people to read, um, valuing journal writing. I'm, I'm a scribbler, I love to, to keep journals and, and I hope you will too. But the power of conversation, when I think about my career, Everything that is notable, I can trace back to a conversation. It began by talking to people, people bringing to me ideas, me sharing ideas and saying, do you think this would work? How do you think? And some of the legacy pieces, one big one, that's I'm amazed at, and but I'm very proud of, that's a part of the New Brunswick School District is something from the arts called dance power. And this was an anthem.
answer to giving students and families, mostly families, the understanding that the arts are for everyone, that it's not elitist. And so a youngster in third grade named the program Dance Power, and it's the longest standing arts integration program in the state of New Jersey, 35 years uninterrupted. And it links a private ballet school, Princeton Ballet, which has long since not been doing strictly ballet, but they do ballet also with the public school um, students and families with the New Brunswick Board of Education. And what I'm most proud of is that this Board of Education with changing leadership, changing superintendents, the one piece that evidently they've agreed to is don't touch the dance power program. <laughs> and that's because of the colleagues in the district, the educators and the families who say, am I gonna be a part of that program? And I rush now to say, to, say to people, we did a lot of teaching of literacy and mathematics and science also, you know, it was. So, connecting, when, when people um, think of you, are there behaviors, are there sounds, uh, is there language usage that comes along with it? I know that for me, there's now a small litany of things that if people say, Inspect what you expect. I see a nod from your brother. That's something I said all the time. That meant that I was going to be in those schools looking to make sure that the literacy program, the math tools, the science lab equipment, everything that was purchased, all the professional development, do I see evidence that it's happening? Connecting the decisions, right? Um, flow and function. How do you move? Do you smile at people? Or do you say thank you, you know, without being prompted? What do people see in terms of your behavior? Dress for success. It doesn't mean the garment that you're wearing, although it did mean the garment that you were wearing. And I would have a hard time um, today because if, if, if I had a hard time with people having their toes out because I'm trying to say, when you break that toe, you're gonna to be out for two days, for a week or that, so that's a problem. Um, so obviously, I will confess to you that I'm not a fan of wearing leggings and, um, and having that be the, the, the perspective of youngsters as we move around the classroom, but I realize where I am chatting. <laughs> and I realize um, my age. Um, chat and chew. When, when I say chat and chew, people, and oh, she's inviting us, you know, to lunch, to dinner, to something, so, you know, uh, so what do people hear, um, or do you have phrases, do you have ways of communicating that, that when they are heard, it elicits a smile, or it, it's welcoming, or is it not welcoming? Does it give a sense of connection from, from being? And so, also, um, what do you have displayed in your offices? What do people see when you're not present? I loved to, um, part of the inspecting what I was expecting was that I visited schools in the evening. Because that's when we often had community events and board of education meetings, so I would walk the schools and read the walls and be curious about looking into classrooms so I could tell myself a story. I should be able to enter your room, enter your school, and tell myself a story about what's happening. You know, connecting when you're not there to, to, um, to tell your story. So what do people see as the evidence of your presence? Um, when they um, come into, into your office or into your workspace and including in your work. Um, environmental learners. I want you to take a moment and to think about this because I do this all the time, including today. 
As you were preparing to come here today, what did you imagine you would experience? What did you hope that you would experience as you were driving here? Connecting your expectations to your reality. I'm going to ask you to also, in your journal, jot down 6 o'clock. And so at 6 o'clock tonight, what will you remember? Not about um, where you sat, but what do you, will you remember about what it felt like to be in the room? <clears throat> what will you remember about um, the rhythm of how you felt? When did you feel like you were leaning in? And when did you feel like, wow, that's really affirming. Let me just take that in. So the 6 o'clock um, message to yourself, and maybe to a colleague who was here, the 6 o'clock phone call. Um, so as you think about um, connecting and, and um, the connecting tissue. It's more the behaviors of what you feel environmentally um, as you come into spaces and as you move around, both in terms of your school, your school and your district, what do you carry forward um, with you? Uh, before I ask you to do some um, some mapping and some collective thoughts on this. One of the things that we talk about is who helped us. We're, we're always talking about who helped us and who continues to help us. Um, I look out at Fidelia and I have a, an affection for her because every time she tuned in to the equity council meetings of the New Jersey School Boards Association, she was a helper to me. I never knew if anybody was going to tune into those sessions. Um, and, but I tell you, 90 minutes after each one of them, well, actually five minutes after they started at first, the first five minutes, I was like, thank God somebody is on the line tonight. And then 90 minutes later when we finished, I said, wow. Participated because it was an elective experience. Had the same um, gratitude for Joanne. And she would show up on a regular basis, um, and Donna McInerney of this organization. Um, so, who would you say helps you? And we're going to have some quiet moments for you to think about that. Helps you in all kinds of ways. One of the helpers um, that uh, I relied upon were, were the people who were the yeah but kids. And that's what I call them, the yeah but people. Um, the disruptors. Disruptors are very helpful if you want to be successful. You <coughs> want to pause with every good idea, with every great initiative, and you want to say, what are the yeah but people going to say? Because when you have worked in your mind and in your body, both sides of the issue, then you will be prepared to go forward. I used to smile, particularly when I was assistant superintendent um, of the New Brunswick School District, because the elementary schools were so lovely to, to visit. They, they tried to be helpful all the time, to be welcoming. The high school prided itself on, here she is. <laughs> what, she got, what great idea does she have? I, I, I have a favorite moment where um, a member of the faculty said to me, when the times when testing and talking about test scores defined us, as they do now, and the, a member of the faculty at the high school came up to me at the end of one of my presentations that I prepared very carefully the language that I used, the rhythm that I used, because I knew who I was speaking to. And this person said, Dr. Latimer, you have such a nice way of telling us we're not doing well. <laughs> one of my favorite memories. Because that, that said to me, I nailed it. <laughs> because 
because that's what I was trying to do in a nice way, make it clear. We've got to turn this around. So feedback, listen to your disruptors and let your disruptors help you be successful. You, you don't do yourself a disservice when you dress for success only taking in, you know, the positive um, because that's not reality. What allegiances might people have that are not a part of your DNA with them? We make a mistake when we uh, enter into situations and we think that we are the alpha and the omega. It began with us and it will end with us. No, there are intervening variables, lots of experiences that people bring with them. We owe it to ourselves to listen to what's happened before and what's the potential. <coughs> I have a favorite moment from um, the arts when I went to see Hamilton on Broadway. How many of you might have seen the play Hamilton? Marvelous, right? I mean, I was told it was marvelous and then I was sitting there and I said, I have not ever seen anything as magnificent as this. Brilliant. There's a moment, you might remember if you've seen it, um, that opens the second act. And Hamilton enters on stage, having been in Paris for a few years. You know where I'm going with this. And he struts around the stage. And he says, what did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? You owe it to yourselves when you have a great idea to pause and to say to someone who was there before you or someone who has come along with you, what did I miss? Before I rush out here and tell people how to adjust themselves, what did I miss? That's dressing for success. So, having shared those pearls of wisdom, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to work with me and to take a look at this map um, and see how you would fill this in. You have a circle and four areas, I'm going to call them, and concept map for journaling. And to think about some of what I've said and in terms of where is your collective? What constitute your connective tissue? So we're asking you, um, who's in your collective? Who is in your, now each of us, we have different words for um, what we call our collectives. Um, what's your word? Advisory. Marie's word is advisory. What's your word, Adele? Personal board of directors. <laughs> she has a Joanne, your, yours is shadow team. A shadow team. I called my people, especially um, well when I was assistant commissioner, particularly when I went out in, into the field, which was not a, a, that was the most difficult and the scariest job I had. And I, I stayed there for for two different administrations, which was quite complimentary. I started with the Library Administration and finished with the Lucille Davy Administration. Almost unheard of. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another little story about connecting. When Lucille came in as the, um, the commissioner, um, you, you know, I, I behaved authentically but, but boldly. And I often forgot that this was um, definitely a position where you served at the pleasure of, I forgot that phrase a lot. <laughs> so I'd be out there doing and conducting, thank God it, it worked for me all the way through, but I would have moments and say, oh my God, back up, back up. <laughs> so Lucille um, fired everybody who had been with the Liberal leadership except me. And, and so she came to me and it was like, I laugh at myself because I sounded like I was out of um, gone with the wind. She <laughs> said, um, I want you to be my chief of staff. I said, I don't know how to be a chief of staff. I don't know how to be a chief of staff. <laughs> I what was I thinking? And 
she said to me, don't worry about it. I don't want a traditional chief of staff. And so I entered into that on faith and, and so forth. But I called the people in the districts where I went, my agents, because I needed people who knew the groundswell, the groundswell, what was real. And I knew that I needed to demonstrate how it felt for me to be in a district that was always struggling, particularly <coughs> if you wanted to just measure us by test scores. There was a lot of richness always in New Brunswick. That's why I stayed for 25 years. I loved it. And I loved um, the work. So, agents. Who are the people that you can go to who will reliably tell you the good, the bad, the ugly, and who will be there understanding the work? So that's one thing. Um, Influencers. Who are the people who influence the work along with you in your community? There are, um, I knew for instance, again in New Brunswick, that um, the chief executive, of, how great was it for us to know Jim Burke, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, to to be invited into his office to talk about how the New Brunswick schools would always be supported by that major corporation. Who influences the work that you want to have done? Um, who are your disruptors? Who are the ones who are the pain in the ass, but they have great content for you? Pain in the ass but great content. They are the ones who are going to know which way that wind is blowing and how strong it is. Um, so you can dress for success. Don't back away. Know what you're entering in and what game you're playing. And groups who hold um, sway, influence. Um, that may be a sorority. It may be a major organization in town, it may be a very strong, it may be the union, yes, <laughs> it, it could be any number of things. So let's take a moment and um, let's see what you would, uh, would scribble for each of these areas. By the way, let me um, influence you to, to um, keep in mind that whomever you, or, or what groups you write, be prepared for them to change. <laughs> Don't lock people in. You know, the disruptors will change. And you'll say, I thought, you know, you, no, no, not for this one, Dr. Latimer, you're over here. <laughs> Influencers will change. Who's new to the community? What corporation? I, I, I'll tell you something that's going to happen in New Brunswick soon that I think is extremely exciting, but we'll see. Um, and that's that the embassy, the Mexican embassy, is setting up a, an embassy uh, right on um, George Street um, at the corner of George, and I think it would be um, either Church or Patterson across from Chipotle restaurant. 
they're going to bring 27 uh, full-time employees there. Now that's an influencer. As soon as they come to town, and you know, some of us know it's, it's happening, why are they coming? But go beyond the why. Give them something to do. It's going to benefit the school. They're coming because the school district has shifted to have Oaxaca, Mexico. I used to say I was going to run a field trip there. I still think we should go. <laughs> because I don't want to There are a lot of people from Oaxaca. In okay, what do you have? Um, who wants to talk about any quadrant of the, of the map? How does it feel, first of all, how does it feel to start where I began with the quiet time of thinking about these four areas? Anybody? Yes. Let's talk a little louder. When I was thinking about it, because I was just one person. Excuse me. Um, of time, I'm going to move on, but I'm going to um, ask you to look at your four quadrants and think about this. Um, what does it take to build a collective? Someone who, on one hand, you admire in your field, is or has been in your circumstance. So that's important. Someone who has been in your circumstance, that's a part of the know something, you know, make sure you're, you're really dressing yourself for success with someone who knows something about where you're going or where you've been. Someone who is unafraid to critique your actions or decisions. Again, right? You don't want to just pick up a lot of yes people. They're, they're not operating in your best interest, particularly as you grow. As you grow, this idea of being able to accept criticism and to understand it is so important. That's um, one of the gifts, by the way, of the arts and having arts integration around you because the arts are criticism all the time, whether you're playing a musical instrument, whether you're acting on stage, whether you're dancing, any kind of dance right. But there is a, it's either there or not. I also like my teaching area, which was French and Spanish. Because you either know how to conjugate those verbs correctly or not, you either have the vocabulary in Spanish or French or not. Or you're not speaking the language. You're doing something, but you're not speaking the language. <laughs> yes, and making sounds, yes. <laughs> um, and it's helpful, someone who is of another generation, someone who's older or younger, right? So I'm, I'm now moving through my sevens, and so I'm collecting uh, very much people who are in their fours and their fives because they understand the lingo and they understand the technology better than I even want to understand it. I don't really want to know how to do all of that. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> I try to teach her all the time. Yeah, she does. She does. This is my, yeah, absolutely. But I want to know about it. And I want to know that other people, I want to know it's possible to 
do it. I don't, all right. And there's still there's people out there who can do it. Who can do it, exactly, and are doing it. Someone who is a leader in, in, uh, in a field that you respect, um, someone who can introduce you. Now, you know, that's the connector part. Who do you know who can introduce you to other people when you want to make a new pathway? Someone who is a champion for education and understands the value of it and will offer a different point of view. That's also very important. Someone who offers you a different point of view. And now, my colleague Marie. No, no. Oh, it's Adele and Joanne. Oh, Adele and Joanne. Here. So, um, what we've shared with you so far are just a few of the tenants that we live by. And if you listen closely to Penelope, she gave you about another. 15 or 20. Um, what we would tell you is those things are just tips of the iceberg. There's really a lot of tenants that we have lived by and, um, and worked by. So what we want to do with you now is just give you a collection of cards on which we've written a bunch of other tenants. We're going to um, share this with you electronically, by the way, in case you would like to use it. You could change the words on it, or you could use these in some way with your staff if you think it would be helpful. But we want you now to look at leadership through the lens of habits, practices, and behaviors, because that's what we're handing you, a pile of habits, practices, and behaviors. We're going to ask you to do um, a few things with these. We call this uh, card sorting, pick one, add one because we're going to invite you to open the bag when we say go <laughs> open the bag sort pass them around review them in any way that makes sense to your table oops i have an extra one here so you're going to re review them in any way that makes sense then we're going to ask you to pick a card that speaks to you in some way that resonates with you a practice that resonates with you. Chat about that for a few minutes at your table. Then we're going to ask you to do one of two things. Either pick a second card that resonates, or is there a tenant that you live by that's not in the final, and that you would sort of suggest as an addition, okay? So you're gonna take a look, then you're going to pick one, chat, Pick another or add one of your own. There's 42 cards in that deck. We don't know if you want to spread them out on the table. You can do whatever you want with them, but we hope you kind of look through all 42 and have some commentary about each of those before you go and pick your one. The goal isn't to just pick your one. The goal is to have a conversation about the elements that are on the deck. We're going to give you about maybe eight or ten minutes to do this.
We're going to ask you to finish up your last thought at your table. It's wherever you are with your cards. Um, and we've made these cards available to you in Mary's Google Drive so that you have a whole set of them. But we're really interested in hearing um, what you've got to say about some of these things. So um, you're having a great conversation and we're not hearing you. <laughs> so whoever wants to start in whatever way, pick your card, tell us what you think. If you've got a bunch of them, tell us if you've added some things that you don't see there that resonate with you as well. So hopefully everybody can at least contribute in this activity. We have time from each table for people to share and shout out about. So, hi, tell us who you, do you need this? No. Okay. <laughs>
just like to say on that point um, that I love to um, annoy um, audiences of um, professions that are the la-di-da professions uh, in, in our world. So if I'm speaking to um, the medical profession or to um, legal profession and such, and I love to say in, at the opening of my speech, I'm here to talk about the profession that informs all other professions. <laughs> and they get it, believe me. So I just want to bring them back to, if you are proud that you can do what you can do, thank a teacher at some level. You know, the, the people think of their elementary teacher. No, thank a teacher at all different levels. So, so, so the, let's remember that what we are advocating for and what we should be proud to be a part of is the profession that informs all other professions. We haven't heard from this table. Um, Cheryl? Well, I picked uh, Think What I Miss, and I have a story to go with this. Um, when I was um, a math teacher, a brand new math teacher, I decided, I was teaching pre calculus hours, and I decided I was going to do something different. And then I Yeah, this table. Thank you, Cheryl. <coughs> Vidalia. Hi, my name is Vidalia Sturdivant, and I chose this part. Say what you are going to do and do what you say. And I chose it because it builds trust and relationships. And I think that as a leader, you should lead by example. So if you're going to lead by example, then you have to adhere to what you say you're going to do, and so that you can have that trust and relationship. So I. Should 
Mm -hmm. And might I add to that, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. Can we get comfortable with that, folks? <laughs> you know, because you think that you always have to have. No. Reveal yourself sometimes and say, I'm not sure just yet. But we'll find out. We'll find out. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Oh. Okay. So now we'd like you to find in your packet that, uh, that envelope that's there and also you have a couple of pieces of plain paper. It's now time, we're going to ask you <clears throat> to engage in thinking about what this experience is going to mean to you. Uh, then come back to when I said being the environmental learner. As you were coming here today, what were you thinking about? What did you hope would be the experience? What were you imagining the start to be? So this is a, a Dear Penelope letter. And the stem is... Um, it's Dear Themselves, not well, Dear yeah, Penelope. Well, I'm mostly. Yes. I, I was reading the faces. I think they were with me in that. Thank you, though. But clearly. Um, and so we're going to ask you to write a letter, a paragraph or two, that you're going to put in this envelope and address it to yourself. And we're going to keep it with the, the coaches here. And you're going to get this letter back at the end of this first year experience. So take some quiet time. to center yourself and to write to yourself of what your, your hopes are for this experience. How are you hoping this experience will contribute to your growth personally and professionally? just for yourself, it's not going to be scored by anyone, the envelope's not going to be steamed open <laughs> by anyone.
think maybe one one more minute? Seems like many of you are. Remember, this is um, a letter to yourself, so you, you're still going to know yourself. you to collect the, the envelopes, if you don't mind. Okay, could, if you will address it to yourself, and Pam is going to walk the room, and, uh, and collect it. There's anyone who has their own little address, I will come and collect it from you. No, no. You're going to keep them in, in, in your... No address, just your name. Yes. yes. Just, just your name will be sufficient because you're getting this back when you're in a session here. that in uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday's uh, New York Times, um, there was a, um, an article that said, to improve business, try journaling. <laughs> so I said, ah, I could use that. So remember when I was saying, like, what do you have up when, you, when people come into your office or around you? This would, if I were in a district and I've been talking about journaling and had invested in providing a journal to um, people in my faculty or in my team, um, this would be an artifact that would be helpful to show that it's not singularly for any one purpose but that the universality of it. So look for um, artifacts that support your positions, the work that you're doing, um, but, you know, um, be prepared to let them go also when they're no longer helpful or useful. Good. Now, Marie. So Marie's going to close it out. Hello again. I'm going to stand so I can see all of you and maybe so you can see me a little bit better. And what I'd like to do is to pull everything you've done so far this morning <coughs> together. There's a framework that maybe we can think about and work from that incorporates the habits, the practices, the behaviors that you've been working with and talking about, as well as the characteristics that Karen mentioned this morning. But before I do that, there, was an, there is an artifact table there that has some really special pieces on it, and we didn't take the time to really share anything that was particularly personal on our part with you. So we're each going to take less than a minute and just share something with you. At this point, I'd like to share this photo of my nephew when he was almost four years old. I don't know if you can really see it, but he's just a child. His eyes and his smile are filled with wonder and curiosity. And I always kept this near to my desk, wherever my desk was, whether it was here as executive director of New Jersey ASCD or whether it was in Vineland when I was assistant superintendent. Because it's a reminder of why we came into this profession. It's to develop and share and grow <coughs> the feelings and knowledge that eventually will become who this child would be. So um, maybe Joanne, you'd share a piece from your artifact table? Um, yeah, I, when the formers get together, one of the things we do is we write together. And so, um, with the ultimate goal, one of these days, <laughs> to turn it into a book. We might write a book. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so I put on the table this bag that Mary, um, one of the things the formers do is they give gifts to one another all the time. 
we like to do that. Yeah, and this is one of the gifts, and on it um, are all the faces of people who have been part of the formers, and um, but it's women who write. So I added that. To our the faces. Table. Are our fa yes, our faces. <laughs> Yeah, one of the, the piece that I picked is this um, sculpture f that represents the Broad Prize for Urban Education. But it goes back to the statement that we started with, that Willa always challenged us in our roles in our own districts, was to know something and to do something. And the other one that she always talked about was from wishful thinking to purposeful change. Um, and I can remember, if you know anything about Jersey City, it was under state takeover from 1989. It was supposed to last three to five years. They were there 33 years. Um, and one day, when I first became associate superintendent, someone asked us, one of the state reps came to this big meeting in the district and said, um, asked, or challenged us to know how many of our third graders were reading on the third grade level. And a group of us at the table kind of sat quietly and looked at each other and thought about it. And then the question changed. Well, take out your special ed students and how many of your third graders are reading on the third grade level? This was in February. And we knew we had a lot of work to do. Well, by September, which is unheard of, we decided to change our reading programs, blah, 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 blah. Two years later, three years later, we were nominated as one of the five national finalists for um, shrinking the achievement gap between low income and minority students at the elementary, middle, and high school levels in language arts and math. And as we, you don't nominate your district for that, you get nominated. So again, this represents the doing something, the knowing something, doing something, and being bothered by it. Can you help me? Mine is to show you um, a book that I did write, um, um, Beloved Educators, Women of Color Who Inspire Us. And the beauty of this book is that it's um, five um, women of color who write about women of color who helped us in our careers. And so I, I want to uh, read to you the dedication page because it does sound familiar. To education, the profession that prepares all other professions and to compassionate educators worldwide. And then, I, um, who, who knew eight years ago um, that two people from New Brunswick, um, you, someone that you, you uh, New Brunswick folks um, call to mind very fondly today, uh, Deborah Wimbush is um, one of the authors in this book. And one of your um, coaches for this project, Gloria Jean Tunsil is one of the educators that we wrote about as a woman who inspired the profession of another educator. So uh, it is still available on Amazon. <laughs> uh, beloved educators, women of color who inspire us. It is unique, it's, it's only 90 some pages. I thought when we completed it, that's such a small book. But um, esteemed authors said to me, that's good because people will read a 90 page book. They're not gonna read our textbooks. Um, and the other thing is that we have not yet found another book where it's women of color writing about other women of color who helped us with our careers. So, beloved educators. You will notice on, thank you. You will notice on the table that there's a bowl of chocolates, all different kinds of chocolates, and they're for you. We believe in a total experience when you bring adults <laughs> together for learning, and at some point through a meeting, through a day, a workshop day, through lunch, whatever, you might want an extra bite of sweetness. And so they're there for you. Please feel free to take them with you. I would also tell you that the framework I'm going to share with you comes from a book written by John Maxwell, which is called How Successful People Lead. And this is a gift that you will get from PSA to each of you. Um, glad you like the idea. It, uh, so, so take whatever notes you like, but don't worry about that because you're going to get the book. And it, it's not huge, and it's 
we think uh, rather valuable. So an overview of what is called five levels of leadership is what I'd really like to talk to you about. The very first level is called position. <clears throat> and all of you already have position. And many of you have more than that. So this is the opening, the beginning level of leadership. Um, the, the second level is called permission. And in permission, people follow you because they want to. In position, they follow you because they have to. You're in charge of the school, you're in charge of a department, you're in charge of the district. They have to follow the rules and what have you that come from you. But in permission, they realize what you're beginning to do, the work that you're doing with them and for them, and so they follow you because they want to. To gather and build a following is the whole purpose of leadership. It is to develop people, it is, it is an area of service, as you think about it in terms of developing people. The third level <coughs> excuse me, is called production. And this level is all about results. You can't fake level three. You're either doing things with people that show a difference, you've made initi initiatives work, you've created change that's improved your setting. So those are the results, and I'll go into that more deeply in a moment. The fourth level is about people development. The first three levels incorporate all that you've been doing this morning. That's the work. That's a huge part of your career to get to level four, which is a rather high level of leadership. In people development, you move from doing things and creating results to continually growing, mentoring, helping people become new leaders. And the highest level of leadership is, is the pinnacle level. And that's not that you've arrived. That means that you are filled with integrity and that people follow you for who you are and who you have become and how you represent the profession. So let's take a, a deeper look, a deeper dive into each position. I'm sorry, each level. So if we think about position, you're an assistant principal, you're a principal, you're a department chair, whatever you are, superintendent, we have a superintendent here. The, the position level um, causes you to create the rules to follow, the policies that are in place, the must do's so that your organization works. I was both in a district and then I led an organization to award winning staff. And in doing that, you don't do that alone. You do that with other good people. But the baseline is you're starting that. In position, it's an invitation to come to the table. It's um, an entry level of leadership. Somebody has looked at you and sees something special in you and invites you to the table. The next piece is that, just what I said, you've been invited to the table. Um, the foundation is that you work from a position, but with people, not over them. And you begin to define your whole leadership style. It starts there. The second level is permission. They, they follow you, people follow you because they want to. They realize that you have identified some of them, hopefully, more than just some, but the people who can lead a grade level, the people who have identified some great instructional strategies, the people who are influencers and have come from the union or not, but other teachers and other personnel in the district listen to them. So those people you want to build around you, you want to create, I call them my advisory, you want to create that surrounding group that will help you do your work and work with you. In addition to that, they, um, they begin to do the work, but they, they add their personal style to it. So it's not all you. 
It's they've experienced it with the people who count and they bring it to the table with them. There's movement. Uh, other staff begin to see that things are changing and they're changing for the better. Maybe someone had a great recommendation and you implemented it. If that happened, then what they're beginning to see and feel is that they're valued. What I say and what I think is important because our leader in that position said, I care about what you think and we're gonna try what you think for the good of others. The last uh, point in this level is that you begin to nurture trust because all through positions levels one and two, people are doing things with you. And a number of you have said early on that when you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. This is where it starts to happen and it grows. So that trust begins to build. And I would tell you from both personally and professionally, that is the greatest attribute you can have. When people trust you, they will do almost anything with you and for you. The third level is production. And as I said earlier, you can't really fake number three because it's all about results. So as your leadership takes off, um, there are lots of things that occur. This doesn't happen in year one, year two, <coughs> and year three. It happens over time. In these first three levels, that's really a huge chunk of your career. Some people advance more quickly than others. That will happen. Others are identified because they really stand out for all the right reasons, and they might do that more quickly. But by and large, in the first three levels, you will have identified your leadership style. You would have produced results that make a difference in your school or your district with others. You will have invited some of your staff to serve on committees or to chair a grade level or uh, to go with you to a conference that's outside of your district or to serve on a state committee where you begin to introduce a much wider realm to the profession. Progress requires change. So you become uh, more or less the chief change agent. You lead it. Others can do it, but you lead it. Once you move into level four, which is all about people, you really have moved into one of the two highest levels of leadership. Not everybody makes level four, and that's fine. You don't need a world of level four leaders. But those who are level four leaders make a very huge difference. And I would say to you, judging from the comments that have happened and occurred over this morning, we have the potential for level four leaders right in this room, a number of them. And that's an exciting thought. So what does it mean to be a level four leader? Well, you move from a results-oriented person in terms of products and things and initiatives and ways to do things into people who function at a higher level. So perhaps you've mentored them or you've done a few things that I just mentioned, like introduce them to some special speakers at a conference level or a state level committee. So their perspective is broadened. And that's what happens in level four. Their perspective is broadened, but so is their skill set enhanced so that they can address a larger group. They can almost immediately identify who has something to contribute and how to do that and why. So they bring to the leadership table a new dimension of skills. That's very important if you want your school to grow or your district to grow. We hear from time to time from parents, from us, from educators, I want to teach in a good school. I want my children to go to a good school. I want to live in a community that has a good district. What does that mean? That means that the people who serve and work in that area are highly skilled, are informed, they care about others, they know how to instruct students. They know how to lead.
So when you've built as a leader that kind of a school community or that kind of a district community, you really have something very special going. We know that South Brunswick is one of those communities. Jersey City won a Broad Award. That's phenomenal. Almost nobody wins that. I would say in the South, I was in Vineland. People came to Vineland to learn how to do things because there weren't many districts in the South who were really moving forward. So we had that advantage. You heard about the programs that Penelope put in place, which are still standing today. That's credibility. It takes a whole new degree of knowledge and skill with people to get to that level. And that's level four. When you get to that level, you should celebrate. You very clearly should celebrate because you're almost at a pinnacle. I dare say, when you go somewhere with Penelope Latimer, her <laughs> fame precedes her. You walk into an area and all these people flock around her. It's just marvelous. And you just stand back and you watch it. <laughs> you say, I want to be like that. How do you get to have that kind of a following? Each of us has that following in the community where we live or where we have worked and where people know us. And that grows. But a pinnacle leader is a person with great integrity, who is inclusive, who doesn't leave people out, but rather draws them in, who looks for, seeks, finds the unique qualities in their staff that can be accented and shared with others so that there's continual growth. So to have reached this level, first of all, is very rare. We don't have a lot of pinnacle leaders. If I asked you to name one, you'd have to think a little bit maybe, unless you're really fortunate and have worked with one. Um, I would say that by reaching that level, the influence of that individual is high, really, really high, among everyone in your community. And in addition, um, you find that there are celebrations to be had. There's a lot different at that level than there was when you began at level one, which is just position. And I don't mean just, that's where you start. But, to, but that level of growth represents a career. It represents tremendous good work that has been done. And it more importantly represents the people with whom you've worked who have grown beyond anything maybe they could have imagined or even wanted or certainly dreamed to do. And that's what we're really, really about. So I would say to you the next slide is a quote, a very favorite quote by um, Harvey Firestone for whom the library of Princeton University has been named. And he says that the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. It's not the easiest, it's the highest. Um, there is a closing thought, a parting thought. It's a cartoon, so we go from you know, something really high to just do it. And the closing thought is between Peppermint Patty and Charlie Brown. And Peppermint Patty says to Charlie Brown, Charlie Chuck, she calls him Chuck, what do leaders make? And he responds to her and says, they make a difference, Peppermint Patty. Leaders make a difference. On behalf of my colleagues and myself, we wish you a great leadership journey. I think you are free to have a candy, to browse around. Lunch is served. Mary, is there something that you would like to say? Oh, I want to thank you. <laughs> You're sharing your wisdom, your experience, your love, your joy, and such a great creative So I thank you all. I hope that you're all going to be going back to your schools and taking some of these But before we go to lunch, uh. <laughs> Mary Reese is also a part of this group of performers, uh, and her story is equally impressive.
as every one of the stories you heard. And um, I know you said that there are not a lot of people that are at a level five, but I would, when I tell you, and, and I use Mary's name all the time, when you use Mary Reese's name in the state of New Jersey, things get done, people <laughs> move for you, and people don't tell you no. Mary Reese is a level five leader, a <laughs> pinnacle that people revolve around, and I would like to just thank you for everything you've done to make today possible, but everything that you've done to make this academy possible as well. <laughs>